All right, good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is Kyrie Williams. I'm the director for the TRHC Campus Center. I'll tell you what that means in a few brief moments. But we do have a studio audience, so when I say good evening, I want to hear some of your energy. Feel some of your energy. Awesome, awesome. So greetings to our ACC Riverbats, our faculty, our staff, our students, uh, both in person and online. I can't see you in the virtual space, but I'm so excited that you're with us. I, I heard that we're at up to a little over 30. Uh, so we nearly have almost 50 folks engaged in this event so far. Um, excited that we are able to have this, have this event in this space. Uh, so thank you to the art department, Peter, to Nicole, to PJ, to our whole art department staff. i uh, so excited to introduce our guests briefly. Uh, but uh, Peter gave me the task of talking to you a little bit about uh, what the importance of this space. So I want to make sure that I uh, share a few tidbits, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let the art department do a thing. Uh, but TRHT stands for Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. Uh, those are some, that's a long, that's a long, long title. It's pretty, some pretty lofty ideals, uh, but I think some important work. Uh, so to just give you a little bit, a little bit of context around what we're going to use the space for, uh, this, this idea was envisioned about six years ago uh, by a bunch of ACC folks. And the ultimate goal, to kind of paraphrase um, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Rose, was uh, that as, as a, a leaders of ACC, we believe in peace, we believe in justice, we believe in inclusion, and that through education and um, education and open dialogue, uh, healing can take place. Uh, so a little bit about this space. We are the first institution in Texas to uh, have a true racial healing transformation campus center. Uh, we're the first community college um, as, a, as a part of the first cohort. Uh, between the uh, Kellogg Foundation and the uh, American Association for Colleges and Universities to have a space like this. The so first community college, first institution in Texas to embark in this work. And essentially this space is um, a, a place for us to have intentional conversations about race, about culture, about biases, about stereotypes, about uh, racism, about cult cultural racism, all those concepts that uh, we, we believe are real things, we believe are true things, we believe are concepts that we need to uh, engage in and unpack if we are to truly prepare our students to be the leaders we want to see in our communities uh, for today and tomorrow. Uh, so what, what does all that mean? So for example, I am uh, I'm Kyrie. I'm Dr. Kyrie Williams here at ACC. I'm the director of the center. Uh, but uh, there's a dichotomy because um, I have this amazing experience at ACC and I have some privileges that come along uh, with some of the things I do professionally, some of the um, See some of the uh, benefits of the report of my education and some, some of the things that I have socially now. Uh, but um, that's one of the problems. What does that mean? Something look like for me when I am uh, potentially in a hoodie and sweatpants and I'm in the community and I'm potentially uh, viewed from a different perspective of just being another black man and some of those negative things that come with that. Um, so, how, how do I, um, how am I able to uh, be courageous and, and share, share that experience with someone in a space like this? Um, how am I able to um, uh, be in a space and really talk about the, even though I work in equity, to do equity work, even though I help lead this work um, that I've been doing so for about 15 years? Um, how am I able to be in a space and be able to talk about the fact that I, I, I'm still working with you, I'm doing some personal work, working through stereotypes and biases that, that, that affect me, that affect the, some of the decisions, actions I make? Um, it's in a space like this. Uh, so essentially, this is a, a space where we can have those important conversations, where we can have some additional dialogues. Where we can come together as a community, uh, talk about the issues, talk about the concerns, but then also start to uh, talk about some of the solutions and how we can move forward. Um, ACC doesn't get better if we don't have honest, candid conversations about the issues and concerns of our diversity, equity, inclusion. But the Austin community doesn't get better if we don't have those same conversations. So we want this to be a place and a space for students, for staff, for faculty, and our community partners to have some of those tough conversations or necessary conversations we need to make ACC better make our awesome community better and also to make the world better. Um, so this space is for everyone. It's for everyone, just like this event is for everyone. We open all of, our, all of our events up to our entire community. Uh, so that's a little bit about the, about the, about the uh, space. We're having our grand opening in April. Um, so we're obviously we're already, already doing the work, but we can't wait to see uh, more of your faces in this space, more of your energy in this space, more of your engagement in some of our events. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it to a, little, a video we have will give you a little more information on our TRH campus center, and then Peter will, will, will take the reins from there. And thank you to the art department, thank you to our media team for all our support. Thank you.
and TRHT Truth Racial Healing Transformation Center came to be in 2017. The American Association of Colleges and Universities put out a call for um, proposals for grants for the first 10 uh, TRHT centers that would be housed at some college or university in the United States. We applied. Lo and behold, little did we know, we would be the only community college chosen and the only Texas institution, which was really exciting for us. A few of the others were Rutgers and Duke and uh, the University of Hawaii and, there were, and Brown University. They were all in the same group as we were. And so that was really exciting for us. As we went on through those first two years, we got to the point where we could hire a director and we hired Dr. Kyrie Weed. I'm really passionate about just making sure that our colleges and universities, places of higher education, are doing the best job to serve all students. Uh, so most of my experience these last 10 years has been um, diversity, equity, inclusion work at institutions of higher education. Really the vision is that this be center, the TRHT Campus Center, is a convening space where we have intentional conversations, intentional learning, intentional growth and development around diversity issues. Brian Joseph is a wonderful community partner. He is an artist and a friend that I have known since the 80s. So we talked about what this center was supposed to be and what we were trying to say. And then he himself came up with the design and the story that goes with it. He calls his people the body people, bringing you delightful, entertaining experiences. My art is always about bringing people together, and that's something that I can really relate to, to this program. With this art piece, I thought about at the bottom, if you look, you see a lot of people, and, it, and I want the energy to come from the people. All people, just communication, getting together, they go, and it's like a wave of people back and forth, moving, and they're all happy because they're colorful, and there's a lot of energy, and in the end, it'll be all diverse, all different colors, people getting together. I think it just contributes to the positive energy here. Like, I see people walk past and stop, and they're like, wait, what, what is that? And we have an open, but so many people have just came in here because they wanted to see what, see the mural and then hear more about what the space was about. ACC took this planning grant to do the planning with the commitment that we were going to have a center that was part of our budget. Again, it, it's so much a part of our values and what we believe at ACC. There'll be tons of events in here. Um, some of them will be live streamed. Um, some of them will be uh, fully virtual, but we have a bunch of events coming up, so if they're open to students, faculty, staff, and community, um, we want everyone to be a part of those discussions and that learning. Hello, my name is Peter Bonfido, and I'm the gallery director at the Art Galleries at Austin. <laughs> I'll start over. Hi, my name is Peter Bonfito. I'm the gallery director at the Art Galleries of Austin Community College. It's my pleasure to moderate tonight's conversation. I'd like to thank Dr. Williams and Sapiro Guzman at the TRHT for hosting this, this program tonight. I'd also like to thank Nicole Bamucci and TJ Hilton who helped to organize the event and our team-led team for running the technical program. Very special thanks to, to the design studio of ISCOM class who created our promotional materials. I'd also like to thank our gallery interns, many of whom have helped with the installation of, excuse me, with the installation of Monaro and McClinton, um, the exhibition. The exhibition Monaro McClinton Negotiating Spaces features the work of Barbara Monaro and Dave McClinton. The pairing of their works is an attempt to create space for dialogue and a means to explore important topics related to race, inclusion, and the freedom of expression. I encourage our ACC community of students, faculty, and staff to come see the exhibition during the opening hours of 10 to 4, Tuesday through Thursday in Gallery 4000. And I invite the general public to reach out to the gallery to make an appointment. Before jumping into tonight's conversation, I want to introduce another project of which Barbara Monaro and Dave McClinton are also part of, The Necessity of Truth. This 138 page book, The Necessity of Truth, features the work of seven Central Texas artists who explore themes of racial healing, social justice, and cultural awareness. The book is TAG's first publication, 
which is almost entirely produced in-house at ACC, from writing to Spanish translation to copy editing and book design. We are very happy to present this free ebook to the public. And you'll see uh, links to get to the ebook as well as links for um, the exhibition and other projects on the, uh, the slide presentation you're seeing right now. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our two artists tonight and then we can uh, start the conversation. Dave McClinton is an Austin-based artist whose, works, whose artistic practice is a mixture of digital collage, painting, and photography. His work explores the history of the African-American experience and how that history continues to define aspects of Black life in America. Barbara Minaro is a San Antonio-based artist who produces textile and fiber artworks that reflect on tactile memories embedded in objects. Much of her work is connected to the lives of Mexican-American immigrants and notions of belonging and migration. So please join me in welcoming David and Barbara. Okay, so um, thank you, really. This is, I'm really thrilled to have this moment. We've been thinking about this, talking about this for a long time. So yeah, have to be. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> it's really, that's a real pleasure. So I'd like to start the conversation by discussing how you balance your personal histories with how you approach your respective artistic practices. So I've, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, your work and your words through the book project for a long time now. Um, and I'm really struck by how your bodies of work have an immediacy. They're really about you as, as individuals, but they also explore very universal themes such as longing and a search for identity. So as we're, as the audience is looking through the slideshow, you'll see lots of images. So Dave, I actually want to start with you. Um, and one of the questions about your work is, you know, who are these figures in your work? And do you see them as, as portraits? Do you see them as an archetype of, of some sort? So the, the figures and the portraits are not real people in their function because they're made up of several different pieces, right? So, you know, the mouths, the eyes, the hands, the arms, everything comes from a different source. So that's, you're looking at an invented person. Like that, it's not just a photo of someone, like they're, they've just been created. That's the function of it. But internally, it's always felt like, particularly the figures, the head to toe figures, are all me. <laughs> Let me explain that. So, you know, just getting through the day, um, I've got to be a lot of different people. I've got to be the, you know, safe person, depending on where I am. I've got to project safety. I've got to project a benignness, despite the fact that I'm 6'1", 300 pound black man, I've got to somehow be harmless in certain situations. Um, and then when I'm just being myself, you can kind of forget that so like the, the figures, particularly that wide piece where the, all those figures are herky jerky and they're changing positions and they're changing um, um, attitudes. Like I feel like that's just me getting through the day. Can you just talk a little bit about your process, just the, the layers and the yeah the yeah. It's, so it started off with um, using family photos and found imagery and lately because I've kind of run through all the family photos. Um, I've been taking photos of myself because I just, all I need is a hand in a certain position or my nose in a certain angle or my eye or whatever in a certain angle and I'm gonna stitch it all together anyway. I'm using um, archival images of uh, runaway slave ads, um, you know, for sale slave ads. Uh, there's a speech I keep going to by uh, Robert Toombs the, he was a senator in Georgia, and it's this speech about why the South should secede. And it, had, it lays it all out, and it's 100% about slavery. So whatever, they, whatever that other narrative is, there's a speech that literally says, this is why we want to secede. I pull things from that. There's so many phrases in that thing that I've pulled out and used in different, in different pieces because it's just such... It's so rich with hypocrisy. It's rich with irony. It's rich with humor. If I put it in a certain place and use it in a certain way. So I'm using images like that. Um, I take photos of textures all the time. Like even just waiting out here to come in. I was taking photos of the concrete. 
because I'm going to use that concrete somewhere. I don't know where, but I'll use it for skin. I'll use it for a background, tree bark, steel, um, the, the, the swirls, the, the polished metal on the inside of the elevator of the building I live in. I've used that before because it has sort of a Van Gogh kind of thing. So, I mean, it just wherever I walk around, I just see touch, take photos and that gets used. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Barbara, kind of a, a, the same question, but I think your answer is going to be very different because yeah. your process is so different. But how do you understand the forms in your work and how do they relate to the materials that they come from? So all the materials that I work with is reclaimed clothing uh, that I either myself lived in. Um, some of them I even brought with me as I moved from, migrated from Mexico to the United States. Some of it belongs to my, my sister, my mom. It's mostly all the women in my life and how we've all shared some sort of history together, but we've lived very different lives, yet still experiencing the same things together. Um, and I think of my work as almost portraits dedicated to them. Also, again, my work's very um, crafty, someone might say, no, I wouldn't refer to it like that but I know it's almost like women's work. And I just like to elevate them and their stories of immigrants coming here with nothing and just starting over. And what was brought with us is carries a lot of importance. So I just try to transform that material to tell another story just and to put it in a gallery setting, which opens conversation. So that's part of my process. Do you, do you feel like they still kind of belong to you when they're, you know what I mean? It's yeah. because now that you put them into a new space, right. does that, do you still have that same attachment or is there something I, change? I don't. And it, I, so I, it's weird. We, again, when we moved, we didn't really bring much with us because we just couldn't, but what we brought became very precious to us. It just carried so much meaning and memories so it but we stored it and then of course we've been here in texas for a while so we continue to consume a lot and i think this is kind of i've seen a pattern with a lot of immigrants that they start to hoard because not having much then being and slowly getting more you just want to keep it and keep it around so me and my mom we would hoard clothing and we would just store it and i we, we would like look through the box here and there and through our boxes of uh, stored clothing and just remember special moments. Uh, so why am I telling you this? Because when I started, decided to uh, incorporate clothing in my work, the first time that I cut one of my dresses, I cried. So I, it was very emotional. And I feel like a lot of the process of cutting and like restitching is meditative, but also it also like kind of releases um, some sort of baggage that I carry with me. So it, it kind of transforms. So no, and I see it and I still remember and I kind of like that it, it, I'm giving it a different life, but it just feels a little distant now. Yeah, the material does. Well, I wanna, you know, one of the things that connects your work and one of the reasons thinking about looking through the images in the book and then, and then Dave, when, when uh, we started talking about that kind of subset of your larger body of work um, in black light, you have figures running, you know, and that immediately made me think about Barbara's work and moving through a, a space. And so I want to talk about the human body, the human figure, and how 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 is that activated? That that notion of moving through is um, it, it's all about the history of the black body when you think about it. There's, you know, it was a, just a means of production for a while. I mean, that was the core function of a black body. It wasn't, it wasn't to carry a soul from one place to another or to carry a mind or a heart from one place to another. It was basically an object to work. So um, where I dip in on that is... Um, you know, some of the, some of the, some slave beds out there that are, that have things for sale. And it'll say, you know, mule, wagon, wheelbarrow, two bucks, two women. 
and they'll, they'll make a special case of if the woman is a uh, child um, bearing age, because she's more valuable because she could have another worker. And it just lists all those things out in the same coldness that the other tools were. So that idea of black body moving through space, it still carries like the ghost of that because we're not very many generations away. So when I was three, I met my great, great grandfather who was 101 at the time. So if you do that math, I'm gonna vaguely have that very vague memory. But if you do that math of when he was born and when he, when he and I were sharing a space, like that's, it's a staggering thing to think about. And then, so all that is filtered through the way I think about black bodies. So then kind of continuing that idea, just then the body is in some ways absent from your work, Barbara. Yes. And so how does that, how does that fit into this? Um, so I, with my installations, I think when I'm installing my work, I think of how the visitor or the viewer is going to experience my piece. So how their body is going to adjust to my piece. Uh, the, one of the broader ideas when uh, installing my work, I think of my experience coming to the United States, how I felt almost forced to an extent to assimilate and to adapt and to you know, just erase a lot of my culture. Um, so I, was, I always wanted to portray that that feeling. So I, with my installations, for those of you who have gone through them, um, you've been able to walk around. And I, in other instances, I've had people where they tell me that they're having to move through it. And maybe sometimes they bump into the work and I know you're not supposed to bump into artwork. So they feel uncomfortable or more self-conscious. Um, so I almost, that's like my starting point for my conversation of that's, how many immigrants feel coming to the United States. They, they're having to adapt to the space and not the space adapt to them in many different ways. So that's where, again, my, my sculptures are very abstract. Yes, they have the human presence because it used to be clothing, but my, the human presence in mine and the movement comes more from the viewer. Yes. So do you, that's, you kind of, Preemptively went into another question I was going to have, which is, do you think about, you know, the viewer when you're making your work? And you do. Yes. Um, and Dave, do you, how, how, do you, how do you put the viewer, the potential viewer, into the artistic process? Or do you try to eliminate that while you're creating? No, I think about it when I think about the, you know, the, the viewing of it, like what that person might be thinking when they see it. And there's always, um, I think about, there are things I don't want to transmit. And I don't want to transmit a sense of uh, fear or a sense of being defeated. Like in all the faces, there's never a, I've never created a face that looked afraid, that looked beat down. It's always a defiant look or a smirk. Or a direct stare, and when I when I when I finish a piece, I'm, I'm looking at it, literally looking at it in the eye. Sometimes it's actually my eye that I've used to do that, and then I think, all right, what? How is this going to affect a person? Like, because they're, they're being stared at by some of the pieces that are just a direct stare, and I and I've been in shows where they didn't know I was an artist, the artist, and I've kind of watched people. And uh, when I was in Lubbock, I was able to sort of sidle up next to people. <laughs> and listen to their comments and listen to their conversations. And it's great. It was like this, it's almost like this little, um, uh, what's it like target research where you can hear what people are saying. Um, and I, so I think about that a lot. I think about how can I portray a black body in a way that is active, that the, the work is the actor almost and the viewer is the subject because I don't want to, I don't want to just create black bodies and black faces for, you know, to, to be viewed as, as sort of a, you know, um, a show. 
Right. I want there to be this active thought back and forth. So that's what I'm always thinking about. I do think about the viewer and how are they going to engage with it? Right. So, so I think about that all the time. The viewer almost becomes the audience for in a lot of ways because I want them to be thinking yeah. about themselves. I want them to be thinking when there's just when there's a black face and they've got a noose for a necktie and they're staring at you. And you're maybe you're a, a white male. What's going on in your head? I hope something. I hope you're thinking about something. So yeah, that's that's where that's that's my how I view the viewer or the potential viewer. That's the really you're you're totally engaging with the history of portraiture in a in a really sophisticated and interesting way. That's um, thinking about how um, the viewer has to then kind of reconcile in some ways as they're they're actually having a conversation with that that person in the in the, in the work. Yeah, it's something to um, it's something that I didn't really I don't I don't know that I was really aware of it until I started talking to people who were buying the work, you know. And um, <clears throat> there was this one piece where there was a noose involved, and an older an older white woman was buying the piece, and I was kind of shocked. I don't know what I I don't know, I had it for sale. I don't know what I was thinking. Somebody's gonna buy it. So when she bought it, I was like, wow. So we're sitting there going through the transaction. It was at East Austin Studio Tour. And I just kind of sidled up next to her and I said, um, you know, where are you going to hang this? This isn't really breakfast nook art. Like, where are you going to put this? And she said, shocked me. And she said, I'm going to put it in the entrance of my house because it's going to make some of my family members, it's going to make us have a conversation about it. I'm like, wow. <laughs> okay. So she like, she trumps she trumped my reason for making art. Like, that was such a deep reason. Like, wow, okay. Okay, and that, that was probably 2016, and I started showing work in 2015. So that kind of helped me form the thought of what the relationship would be with people who were looking at the work. Right, yeah. So Barbara, you know, like just I kind of gonna keep digging down into this because I feel like it's such, such an interesting idea that, and it also ties your work together. Um, you know, when people are in, inside of one of the environments, you talk about them being environments sometimes, and um, they, um, they have to adapt, they have to change, but they also are essentially activating the work, right? right. The work is, isn't necessarily complete until there are people inside of it. Yes. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I, yeah. And yeah, that's at the beginning when I started creating my when I first had my installation, I didn't think about that. But once I saw a person in the space, that's when I felt like it was complete. Especially when there's more than two, and just having to interact within themselves, but also the work. Well, I've seen I've been able to see that firsthand. We had a few classes come right. in, and some of the students that you know have gotten emotional just. Just and they're not not sure why, or they maybe they do know, and so that's definitely part of it. There, there is a um, a reaction that, that, but it's inviting at the same time. It's always a right. kind of a positive, and thoughtful uh, idea. And I think that's because of the color palette. It's playful. It reminds people about their childhood. And I know, I mean, textiles, especially clothing, is so universal. So I feel I feel like people can connect to the work unconsciously, even though they don't know. They might not know what the work is about at first. I want to kind of follow up with, with you um, talking about text, because with colorful um, fabrics, you also have very colorful texts in a variety of different ways that you're, yeah. you're, um, uh, you're putting them in. So can you talk about how you select text and then also selecting the, the the type of um, process to put them in. Sure. Place. So actually, text is fairly new to my work. I started uh, introducing text during the pandemic. Uh, before it, it was just pretty much an abstract, just a sculpture sitting in a gallery. And I feel like during the pandemic, I I would always have a. I mean, I was at home, so I would always have a notebook 
with me that I would just write things that would resonate with me. It could be something that I heard in a podcast or something that I read or something that I heard in a song or I or just things that I would think about. So I would just randomly scribble things or sometimes if I had a dream about something, I would just write it down. So I that's why I I, I tried to be very intuitive with my work. So I, I didn't really question me having a notebook and writing. So it, um, I almost felt a need to start incorporating those fragmented sentences or words or phrases to my work. Um, and I also, some, like, there's one uh, over at the gallery with says, gorgeous, gorgeous girls migrate to the US. And that's very much contemporary. If anyone's on TikTok, that's like a trend. So I just really wanted to adapt it to to the now, but also to this broader uh, conversation that it um, migration is happening now, not something that happened. I don't know. It's it's happening now. It's a struggle. I lived in a border town when I moved to Texas, and just having that uh, um, proximity to that, it just that it's something. It's real. It's happening. And it, sometimes people see that very. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Distant, so I I don't know. I just wanted to kind of connect pop culture to migration and just like kind of start that conversation. And then I also uh, there's another sign at the very back, and it says uh, "Bienvenido a casa paisano," and that's a sign that I would always be driving back from Texas to Monterrey, which is my hometown. And it's a sign that it says like "Welcome back, uh, paisano," which paisano is like people that migrated to you to you to the U.S. to work. And most of the time, send back money to their family members. So it, I like, I, it, it felt nice. It felt like I was coming back home, and it was just like a greeting. So I, I felt like I wanted to add that. But um, again, text is so new to me, and I always done abstract work. So it's, it's something new that I want to continue exploring. Yeah. Okay. Also, you know, and and when does that? Of enter, you can talk a little bit about it, right? But when does that enter into you? the process? Because they're so, um, they're really extraordinary. Actually, you talk about, uh, and explain it to me, the, the text uh, that's in the background of that. Uh, so that was, um, I found online, I found this uh, series of corrected by hand manuscripts to the novel uh, Sound and Fear. And there's a character in that, in that novel named uh, Dilsey. And Dilsey is a servant who is older than some of the younger Black people that she's essentially complaining about. So it was a time right after, um, uh, right after the war, but before Jim Crow, where you would see things like Black Wall Street being built up. You would see these things, you know, um, uh, Black people were going to school, Black people were founding colleges, and there was this thing happening, and she was of a generation that it frightened her, and she thought it, it, was, it was something that Black people shouldn't do. Because I think that she was, her character, this person was just so afraid. She had been beat down for so long. Try to keep your head down. Don't don't strive, just do what you're supposed to do. That when she saw younger black people striving, living their lives, it it kind of took her back a little. So my my uh, parents, aunts and uncles, and and uh, my great aunt, they lived in they grew up in Texas in the 40s and 50s. So you can imagine what that was like, right? Um, so they would always give me this this dual advice of um, just like Dilsley, don't stick your neck out. Like stay, don't let, don't draw attention to yourself on one day and then the next day you can get out there and be anything you want to be. Like, all right, which I am not to do here. <laughs> so that piece is about the, those different bodies and they're changing and some are jumping and celebrating. Some look like they've just been hit. Like they've all the different things that those bodies are going through just fits with that text. And I didn't find the text and think of the art. And I didn't start the art and, and think 
to find the text. It was, it was just one of those things. Yeah. I, I was working, and actually all those bodies, some of those three, at least three of those bodies were intended to be their own thing. And then I thought, I need to, let's make something big here. So all of those things sort of happened at once and there was no plan. Like I didn't just kind of, I came across the text and thought, oh, that's, that's how I felt all my life. And it just kind of fit. So yeah, there wasn't a plan really. Just kind of, and that's generally how my work goes. There, there's never a plan. I just sit down and start making something. And halfway through, a narrative is revealed. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is really great. I want to just take a quick uh, break from asking questions because I want to encourage the audience and also on, um, uh, on Zoom in the chat to uh, put in some questions and we'll do question and answer um, just in a, in a few minutes. But I also want to give you that opportunity. Do you have any questions for Barbara? Or Barbara do Absolutely do. Yeah. Um, so when I first walked into the space, you you said, go ahead, you like you said, go ahead and walk in. And yeah. I, I felt like I needed permission. <laughs> right. To walk I, in. I felt that from you. So yeah. I wonder like do how many people stand on the edge and look at it like it's a thing to be looked at from the outside and not walk in? Because when I did walk in, it felt like um kind of uh, like I had like this sense of um, reverence like I didn't want to mm-hmm. like I didn't want to touch anything and right I, wanna, I was just like man this is this is somebody's art piece like I'm, <laughs> I'm walking through it I shouldn't be doing this yeah <laughs> that's what it felt like so I'm just wondering how many people ask permission or have to be told that yes you can walk in and, and experience it it's it's funny because that's very common uh they always ask for permission. And even when I say yes, they move with caution. So I'm like that. What I want to happen is happening. Like that's how I felt. Like just, yeah. you're like, okay, yes, I can be here, but don't be too disruptive. Don't be too loud. Uh, just act quietly and try to just move around very carefully. So, but I've had kids that just, I, I remember this one time. Uh, specifically I had one kid just run to a piece and hug it so it, I don't know I love that but I I guess as you grow older and you like come to like realize your relationship to the world you're just having to adapt and walk in be careful with your steps yeah, yeah yeah I definitely felt that I definitely felt like that this was something I needed to be like cautious around you know uh-huh. I don't know why I, just, I love that yeah though. I mean, not that I, I hope that now you can go back and experience yeah. it. Yeah, no, but you're right. Like that, to, to translate that is this is how I feel. Yeah. This is how immigrants feel. That's a direct translation. Yeah. And that's a great thing. Like, that's a powerful thing that art can do. Like, you can, in five minutes, you can literally explain to someone, okay, now that you've walked through that, did you feel awkward? Yeah, right. Did you, were you worried? Yeah. That's how I feel every day. Yeah. And then I feel like that's, there's a great conversation uh, with your work and mine because even though these are two different experiences, I think we can both relate with having to like adapt and just see how we can like, exist in like this world. And I, I, my question for you is how do you, first of all, I don't know if you've ever had your work um, just face each other, like those three pieces and then that larger piece how does that communicate? And then how does that communicate with my work that's also about movement, but it's just different. I feel just the way it's the way that show is set up right now, it feels like one side is telling you this is what you're gonna experience. Uh-huh. And the other side is like they're almost like they're these um three advisors. Okay. <laughs> kind of yeah. like saying, all right, because the, the woman she's got a fist and then she's got a hand open like this. She's kind of like, good luck. Right. And then the farthest figure is actually facing, is actually, you know, it's kind of turned sideways and has a, this sort of awkward relationship to it. So it really does feel like these three people are trying to tell you what this is about to be, but then you look over at these bodies and it's almost like they're the ones running through right. it because it, they do feel so awkward on this side. And there is that weird activation that yeah. It's, it's, I mean, that's, I think that's just one of the reasons I like doing the collage the way I do it is 
you know, I'll find a leg and a foot and an arm and a body that don't belong together. And when I put them together, it's that weird awkwardness that, that we're both talking about what it's like for me, what it's like to be a black man in Texas. Right. It can be really awkward sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, I think that the, the fact that our mediums are so different mm-hmm. but are saying some of the same things is pretty, pretty astonishing. Yeah. And even just like I guess more like formal elements, just like the texture. Yeah. And you're just you're it's your work is so heavily textured. Yeah, it's flat. Yeah, and when you were talking about it, some of these fabrics are from like it's from your life, things uh-huh. like maybe even something you've worn, like the dress. Yeah. There are some fab there are some pa- some some textures and patterns that are in the work that like one is um uh, a couch, my grandmother's couch. Oh, right. that I just took a photo of. Yeah. Um, one is, um, uh, I used a, I found this old photo of me sitting at her kitchen table and the tile on the floor. Uh-huh. So I just was able to take that little corner of that tile and then recreate the tile. So there's, there's a lot of textures in there that when I look at them, I don't see, you might see it as a background. Right. And when I see it, I think my grandmother's floor. Mm-hmm. So, like, there is this, this emotional connection to a lot of the stuff in there, too. So, right. that's pretty interesting. I know. I love that we both kind of uh, integrate our family's history. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience, or if we have anything on uh, from the chat. No? Not yet. Okay. Well, uh, anyone in the audience, just raise your hand to joke around it. I saw one book that looked like it was referencing copper and pennies. There was like an eagle wing and something that looked maybe like a, a swirling of metal, but it's also wood grain. Can you describe what you were wanting with that? Um, do you remember which piece? There's uh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, so the figure was facing to the viewer's right. Okay, yeah. Not a yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, um, so there's almost always a reference to um, money or some sort of currency because there was a time when the actual black body was also currency. So, um, and I, I'm kind of a smart ass, so there'll be references that don't necessarily fit the piece, but it makes me giggle. So, you know, I'll use um, a South African Krugerrand for an eye, or I'll use, um, so minstrel shows used to take actual coins and they would strike some sort of logo or phrase into the coin because a lot of minstrel shows were illegal. So you couldn't have a ticket, but if you had a coin that said that Mitt Wander had their logo stamped into the coin, that was their way to get into the show. So I use those for eyes a lot. So whenever you see something like copper or um, some sort of metal, I'm referencing currency. When you see something like um, uh, asphalt or concrete, I'm referencing um, a support structure. So asphalt, concrete, we walk on it every day. It's this thing that supports us everywhere we go, some sort of structure. Um, To me, that's a very, it's loose, I'll admit, but it's a, a, a loose metaphor referencing the fact that black bodies essentially, to a point, built the country. So that reference of the black body is this thing that's supporting us, that we wouldn't be where we were. There are a lot of millionaires out there because of black bodies. There are a lot of powerful people out there because of black bodies. That structure that's still holding them up today was a black body. So I like that metaphor between material and what it means to be a black man. So that's that's the connection. I, I know it's a can be a loose thing, and I'm packing the pieces with so many metaphorical things that it gets overwhelmed. I don't even remember them all. <laughs> I'm interested in that uh, that plethora of metaphors that are in each one of your pieces. There are so many references to physical. Uh, that represent other things. How do you, does it bother you or is it fine for you that we get some of it and some of it passes over our head or does it, different people get different things? How do you put your that, that, that It doesn't bother me. Um, I hope that you're just racking your brain sometimes. 
Um, some of them are pretty obvious. Um, the lately, I've been I've found a lot of these antique buttons that were um, for a women's suffrage movement, and um, you know when you consider what's happening to the Voting Act these days, uh, to reference back to, it's almost like I'm trying to communicate to women, hey, remember when you couldn't vote? Like, it's about to happen to us again if we don't pay attention. So I like those little metaphorical cues to just kind of think about that, like that's where that... So yeah, I, but if someone doesn't get it and they just enjoy the aesthetic of it, that's actually fine too. So um, Barbara and me, so talk to me about, I'm not an artist at all, so talk to me about the process when it comes to naming or providing the title for those pieces. So how does that work? Um, sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a metaphor. Sometimes it's an end joke for myself. Um, there was a, there's a piece called uh, uh, right now it's called um, arbitrary mood, and it's about how our moods and, and how we feel about certain things are just arbitrary. Like the, the the people that the media decides we should care about, you know this person murdered by police, this person not. There's so many people that are suffering through that that we never hear about. It's just the media decided, well, let's make this person special. And that's a very arbitrary thing. And in my mind, flipping those words, arbitrary mood really sounded like a mood arbor. So to me, there was just that. And that's just for me. Like, I didn't expect anybody to get that. I didn't expect it. It's not important that anybody knows that. But sometimes the names of the things are just for me to connect while I'm working on it. So I can have that narrative in my head of this is why I'm doing this. So, yeah, some of the names are really, honestly, just for me. Yeah, I was going to ask Mark, but I want to ask, so kind of share a little bit more when it came to the colonial piece, how you make that associated with the that we have. So that piece was inspired by um, a photo of uh, um, James Baldwin. So the arm of that in that piece is from a photo of James Baldwin, and I just built everything else based on that. So I would find I, I took my I took my own um, blazer and sort of put it in that same position, so I could get the lapel right and I could get the fold right, the pocket right. And the when you think about what a colloquialism is. Like people throw his name around a lot. And I don't know that people necessarily hang on to the depth of what he was really talking about. He's, he's almost like a, he's almost like his name is shorthand for talking about race, for talking about the country. And I don't know if people truly appreciate it. So again, that the name of that piece was for me to hang on to. To, to make sure that I need to be very, and it's not just for that piece, that thought process is really important to me to make sure I'm understanding what I'm communicating and I'm not just being arbitrary to go back to another name. That some of these, sometimes the names of the pieces are to keep me on point. So that's, that's why that's called that, our uh, colloquialism. Barbara, can you talk about your titling a little bit? Because it's, it's really interesting, again, I'm working with the book and thinking, talking to you about titles. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, yeah, I don't, I feel like I don't think about the title as I'm working through the piece, but it, it comes to me at the end. Um, a lot of it is either, if it, if it has text, then it's named after the text, but for this piece in particular, the one I have at the gallery, um, I titled it in Spanish, The Paso, and it's passing by. So it, for me, it was more like the experience that the visitor has. They're literally passing by through the work. So I just, um, I hope, um, and maybe that's hoping too much, I don't know, but just that when people read that is that they're encouraged to just pass by the piece. So it's almost like a small instruction, but not just leaving it open and it, Yes. Are any of them ever those, we were talking about those kind of fragments of um, 
of text that you put in the pieces? Are the titles ever those same things or do you feel like those are completely different and your titles are more your own kind of description of the piece instead of a component of the piece? I think it really depends on the piece. Some, um, some do come strictly from the passage or fragment of words that I use and some are more just the feeling that I had while making or whatever I was thinking about while making the piece. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, TJ, can we take one of the uh, Martha the from the internet asked, uh, asked me to ask you to tell about your artist origin story. And I think she means more of not how you began to start making art, but how like basically your path to become the artist that you are today working in the, the ways that you work. <laughs> I I don't think I've ever thought about this or how it started. I feel like it's not that it just happened because since I was young, I wanted to be a creative person. I grew up with my mom being a seamstress, uh, my grandma being a seamstress as well, uh, and just musicians in my family. Um, but yeah, since a young age, I knew I wanted to be an artist and I didn't really know what a, being an artist was, but um, yeah, I just, I mean, it's not, I bet mean, there's interesting parts, but I can't think of anything right now. But yeah, I, when I moved to the US, I, I felt like I had a lot of alone time, didn't know the language. And I feel like that's when it, it really, uh, I just, my friend was art. So I would just draw and draw and it just, I kind of like, I think life was kind of telling me like this is what you really want to do and this it just went from there. When when did you decide to go into an arts program? Like when did that happen? Until it's funny because I was a I was originally I wanted to be an environmental scientist, but when I was picking my major, I went with art. I am I'm a very intuitive person and I just felt a strong uh, connection to art. So I was just like, I'll do art. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I, when I was in school, um, I was taking studio classes and design classes at the same time. And uh, right when I got to a point where I needed to decide which way to go, um, going back to what I was talking about earlier, like fear and, and practicality took over and I decided to go design instead of art. Um, and then, you know, 15, 20 years into an art uh, design career, I would, you know, you get a creative block every now and then. And I was doing like digital collage just for 30 minutes. You know, I would set a kitchen timer and just play with stuff at the beginning of every day to get ready to do the other work. It was just a way to get out of my head. And every now and then something cool would happen. Like moves mostly bad, but every now and then something cool would happen. Um, and then, um, uh, Trayvon Martin was killed. Mike Brown was killed. All those, all these things started happening. And as I was thinking about all those names, like shame is what came over me because I realized I already had a list of names. Like there was already a list of names of, of young black people who were who were killed. You know, you, you said Hawkins, um, Emmett Till. Um, there's so many names that I just know in my head because I've been reading about those names in Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine all my life. So it was shame that made me become an artist because I needed to, I needed to get some of that stuff off my chest. I needed to talk about it. And um, when those things started becoming more and more prevalent, things that I'd always known, things that I'd always tried to talk about, were finally being given voice by cell phones and, and internet, it just kind of hit me like, I've been carrying around names for 30 years. What am I doing? I should be doing something. So it was a shame that I hadn't been using art to express myself is what made me become an artist. Just 
like shredded jeans. Can yes. you talk a little bit about the significance of, of them, how they came about? So um, all of, like I said earlier, all of the, or not, not all of, everything that I, the material that I use is reclaimed clothing. So I, uh, when I was first trying to transform this material, the clothes, I wanted to still have some sort of like human presence or like bodily like. So I, for me, those pillows kind of remind me of limbs somehow. Uh, but they also transform into like a ladder that doesn't really take you anywhere. So just thinking about, again, movement, the body, your spaces. So it just, these bigger ideas, that's how I started developing them. Um, and it's funny because I feel like in this exhibition, you can really see the transition of more uh, pillow-like or stuff sculptures to my newer, more flat work. So I feel like this, Exhibition is really a transition. Uh, or, and you can really see how the pandemic kind of affected my work and it's like visually how it kind of transformed from the back where it's like pillows, more like limb-like to more flat. Uh, just like, not just something that's heavier, which is like hanging and it has a different presence. Um, but it, it, it also, I guess I'm also, uh, what I do with the material dic is dictated by the material itself. So again, I really do communicate with the textures, the fabric, and again, I feel like I'm a very intuitive person and I la let the material speak to me to an extent. Well, I think we're going to start wrapping up, but if there are any other final questions. Yes, um, I understand perfectly the meaning of the duration both of the works. I'm Mexican, then I understand that perfectly. But just want to know how important is for, for all of you to make a balance between the meaning that you try to transmit and not to be offensive. Is, is this something important in the work or it's something else? It's not important. This was something uh, important in the process or not? I don't really care. I mean, I don't. <laughs> Stick with it. Stick with it. But I don't care if I offend. I mean, I normally would care, but I don't really care if I offend someone because if I do it, that's resonating with them and that's something that they need to confront and think about. And it, it talks more about themselves than it does me. I'm just portraying something that's real and it's happening. and why if i felt uncomfortable for so long why not why shouldn't they uh i've adapted long enough and i it's just it's just life and it's something that's really happening so i don't i don't think i should be uh apologetic <laughs> yeah. hey, David, I want you to answer that question <laughs> yeah <I don't laughs> <think you're laughs> oh. um yeah it's the same um i'm really just I have this habit I tell, I answer questions through anecdotes. So um, I was doing a show, part of an art fair in Dallas. And some of the work is benign, unless you know, and then some of the work is blatantly trying to be provocative. And there was one piece that was right over my left shoulder behind me, and I knew where it was. And I'm watching faces walk by all day. And I can see... When a, when a black person would see that piece, I knew which one they were looking at. They would stop, they would look at it, they would look at me, they would look back at the piece, they would nod, and then they would just go on their way. The only people that stopped to argue <clears throat> were older white people. And I knew, I was like, well, I got you now. Because now, like, you're getting, you're all just <laughs> jangled up with offense and guilt and what's what am, you know like so that whole thing of whether or not it's offensive I don't I don't care either like that's the point of it so I had a conversation about race me I'm, you know at the time 40 something black man with a 65 something 60 year old white woman we were talking about race in Dallas Texas that never would have happened that conversation never would have happened if it weren't for that piece of art that was on my shoulder so yeah I don't I don't really care either. Thank you. So that's, I mean, that's what 
that's why we have exhibitions. That's why we have, you know, that's why we want to bring people in and into the gap into this gallery and specifically, but also just to other um, other works because it provides that space to talk about something. It actually gives um, it gives a point of reference, really, right? You can talk about the work and then you can talk about what in the work might offend you, might you um, also um, kind of recognize or feel kinship to, right? There's all these different emotions that that people can have and ranges within within work. So it is a great form to, to really, I think, dig deeper into a lot of these, these issues. And so I want to end by thanking both of you. I learned something from you every time I've talked to you. It's really amazing. Um, and uh, I really am very happy that we got to share this with our ACC community and with uh, everyone else on Zoom. And so please uh, join me in thanking you. Yeah.